Hello my beautiful PhD friends. So today we're gonna to talk about how to choose your PhD supervisor and all of the little things that they don't want you to know about them. If you're new to this channel, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification because I'm gonna talk about all of the dirty little secrets about a PhD that no one else will tell you. Okay, let's have a look at the first little thing about a PhD supervisor that you need to know. Your PhD success will be primarily dictated by your supervisor. Now the student supervisor relationship is so very, very important. It can make or break a PhD and like anything, it's a relationship that you need to build and that relationship is hard work even if things are going well. It comes down to open communication. It comes down to essentially like a colleague slash boss that you need to interact with every single day. And if you just don't like aspects of their personality, if, you, if they are a pain in the ass to work with, that will severely impact your PhD. Now that's because a PhD is just about consistency, working every single day. And if your supervisor is stopping you from doing that for whatever reason, it can really impact the time that you're doing a PhD, the quality of your work, and also your mental health and well-being, which is so much more important than anything else to do with a PhD. Okay, the first thing that you should know is obviously their area of expertise. Um, now, you know, when you Google these people, when you Google a potential research supervisor, um, you will see, you know, their, their staff profile page, they may even have had, had a news article written about them. That's not what I'm interested in if I'm selecting a PhD supervisor. The one thing I'm interested in is what are they actually researching about and how are they telling the world? So I go to Google Scholar. I go to Google Scholar and I type in their name and I look at their most recent articles, not their most popular. So by looking at their most recent articles, you're looking at the current state of their research. And what I would do is download them um, and have a look. And you know, there are some ways to get every single um, uh, peer reviewed paper. Uh, Sci-Hub, for example, is one of them. I don't know how legal it is, but you can access pretty much all of their papers for free. Um, and if you need to reach out to them and also ask them because supervisors and academics have copies of their, uh, their papers, their peer reviewed research, and they'll be more than happy to share it to you for, for free. Um, so yeah, and send it to you by email. So have a look at their current most recent papers. Have a look at the introduction. Now, I'm not expecting you to like know all of the ins and outs of it, but what you can do is be like, is this at all interesting? Does the abstract interest me? Does the conclusion bit interest me? Is the current research relevant to my interests? Like that's what you're really asking. Um, you're probably gonna be a little bit confused about like the density and the language in the paper, but ultimately if the first bit, if the introduction and the first bit of the abstract grabs your attention, then maybe that's a good fit for what you're interested in. Um, another thing to look for is the university at which they work, you can probably download past students' PhD theses and master's theses. Um, so in the past, you had to go to the actual library where they work and download, so if you can do that, great. Um, but now you can just get them online and you can have a look to see if that area that their current or slightly, you know, graduated, just graduated PhD students, if that interests you. And that's much better than just Googling them and finding out that someone wrote an article on them. Uh, you know, because if an article has been written about by uh, say journalist, it generally is pretty interesting. Also the journalist has done a lot of work in translating that into something that's palatable for the everyday person. So yeah, go straight to the source, look at theses, look at um, their recent peer reviewed papers. And if they're giving a talk in the near future, maybe you could attend that. So the second thing I recommend you do is you reach out to their current and just graduated PhD students. Now the good thing about peer reviewed papers is there's a list of uh, authors 
and the first author will generally be a PhD student or postdoc that has worked in their group and your PhD supervisor will be one of the last names. So what I would do is reach out to those people. You can find out who they are, you can find out if they work for them, make sure that the um, institution that they're affiliated with is the same and almost certainly there'll be uh, someone who works underneath them, like I said, a postdoc, a PhD student or a researcher um, in their team. And the thing is, you know, these academics, as clever as they think they are, they're just people. They're clever people, but they're just people. And like people, they have egos. Like people, they have weird bits about them. Um, maybe they're not super organized. Maybe they always overpromise and underdeliver, which is one of the worst things about a PhD supervisor. Maybe they're not as supportive as they should be. Maybe they're always traveling. You know, these people, the more success they get, the more uh, PhD students are attracted to them and ultimately less time they have for you. Some of the best PhD research supervisors I've seen are new appointed researchers that have no track record. That's because they're invested in the success of their students. They're not, you know, gallivanting their ego around the world um, on stages, you know, giving talks or being drawn away to different boards and meetings and collaborations. You know, they're focused on their students. So just because someone is super successful doesn't mean they're going to be a great PhD supervisor and arguably the more successful they are the worst of a supervisor um, they are to PhD students. So I will speak to current and slightly graduated, uh, just graduated PhD students from their group and ask the awkward questions, um, you know, like is this person organized? Do you like this person? Um, have they got time for you? Do you feel appreciated? Um, because PhD students can just be seen as like workhorses of the lab, i.e. Um, get two papers this year on this and this, come back when you've got the data. You know, like that's the worst type of supervisor. You need someone that does nurture you a little bit. Um, some supervisors have got the opinion that you are there to be self-directed and learn and, you know, produce papers which they'll gobble up, which is, you know, fine for some people. Some people like that challenge, but other people need, um, yeah, a little bit more nurturing. And each supervisor have has their own quirks. Like, if I think about all the past researchers I've had, I could probably tell you their, their top, like, three things and their worst three attributes. And uh, I'd quite happily share that, you know, in private, not on the YouTube channel to everyone in the world. That'd be a bit mean. Okay, the third thing that I think is so important about selecting a PhD supervisor is their personality, right? So when we were talking about their area of expertise in the first one, perhaps you can just chat with them, right? Maybe you can just sit down with them for an hour, half an hour, whatever it is, and be like, hey, I'd love to join your team. I'd, I'm, you know, investigating some options. Um, would you be able to sit down? And in Australia, they love a good old fashioned coffee. You sit down with them. Now, the thing is, anyone can be nice for like half an hour during a meeting. It's when things aren't going well, when they haven't got the grant, when their paper's been rejected, when their collaboration has fallen through, that's when they become horrible people. I've seen it time and time again that these, you know, super competitive, really kind of driven people become monsters if things aren't going their way. And in academia, they do not go your way a lot. It is so political that it really brings out the worst in nearly every supervisor. I've been shouted at, I've uh, had people cry at me, um, I've been sort of made the scapegoat of a number of different things. Uh, you know, not saying I was a perfect PhD student, but these people are fragile. <laughs> As far as I can tell, their egos are just like balancing on this very fine point and that, you know, anything can push them off their, off this, uh, this kind of finely balanced uh, homeostasis they're in. So anyway, go for a coffee, have a chat with them. You're not going to get everything that you need to make a decision, but you just need to know during a coffee, do they seem present? During a coffee, do they... Um, do they care about you as a person? Um, are they able to chat? And one thing I do is I, I tend to meet up with, with 
PhD supervisors or or potential um, supervisors when I was a postdoc and be like, have we got something in common? Like, what do they do other than their work? And it was a little bit of a red flag for me if they didn't have anything other than their work. Because from my experience, if someone doesn't have anything other than their work, their work is their life and they are so sort of, in, their, their identity is so intertwined with their work that the, the times where it goes wrong is the times where they blow up because that, that to them reflects directly on their personality and they get horrible. So yeah, personality. Is it someone you can sit down and talk to? Do they just seem nice? All of those things are so important because you're gonna have to see this person every single day for at least three years. And if they're not nice for a half an hour coffee meeting, they're definitely not gonna be nice when things aren't going their way. Okay, number four is all about compatibility. So we've kind of had a look at their, um, their personality with a coffee meeting. And as part of that coffee meeting, I would start asking for their expectations and then measure that against what you want. So um, compatibility, you know, you've got you, you've got the supervisor, what common ground have you got for this potential PhD candidature? Is it that you know, they expect you to be self-driven, but you want someone that's a bit more hands-on. Um, what type of supervisor do they think they are? Which is an interesting question to ask them. Like, are they a micromanager? Do they like to do all these, you know, do they like to have their fingers and everything? Or are they a bit hands-off? Do they travel a lot? What expectations do you have? And what expectations do they have? Do they expect you to be seven days a week in the lab? because that's a common reality of many, many research groups. Now, um, it wasn't so much when I was doing mine. I, I always had weekends, mostly had weekends, apart from towards the end. Um, so yeah, you know, you, do they appreciate that if you're an international student that you'll want to go home every so often? How are they going to support you? Because remember, you're bringing a lot of work to them. It's not like, it's not like you're a leech, right? Initially, you're going to learn stuff and then towards the sort of middle of your PhD, you're going to start to be turned from someone who's learning to someone who's producing, someone who's driving the project. And that is incredibly valuable to them as PhD supervisors because without that, they do not have a job, I guarantee you. Without the people in the lab underneath them, um, they have zero output, right? When is the last time a PhD supervisor went in the lab for like a month to produce some work that ended up in a paper? I can guarantee you almost none of them have done that. The people at the end of the peer-reviewed papers in the author list have, have got the money, they've got the, um, the collaborations, the relationships, but they did not sit in the lab until midnight collecting that data. Um, and so you have to remember that you are valuable to them. It's not a one-way relationship. In fact, like I said, you know, you can choose multitude of research um, supervisors. They need you. They need you to be in their little pyramid um, and producing work because without that, they don't get grants, they don't get papers and their career completely tumbles from underneath them and crumbles away. So uh, yeah. Have a look and, and be upfront with the sort of opportunities you want from it. So do you want to teach? Do you want to, um, do you want to do something more in the community? Are you looking to be pushed towards policy and decision makers? Like, have they got connections that help you achieve what you want? Because you're gonna do a lot of work for them and they should return the favor by positioning you at the end of the PhD in a position where you're able to sort of jump into that next project, that next thing, that next job. Um, and yeah, that's the reality of it. And a lot of PhD supervisors forget that and uh, they feel like you owe them something, uh, which, you know, you don't. Without them, they're nothing. It's a bit mean, isn't it? Check out my other video on the seven mistakes that PhD students make. Um, that will tell you everything you need to know about this kind of like opportunity, about navigating the relationship, all of that sort of stuff. So go check that out because I don't want you to make the same mistakes that a lot of PhD students make. And uh, yeah, one of the biggest things is expectations and compatibility with that supervisor. So go check out that video. I'll put the link wherever that goes around here. 
Okay, the fifth thing is all about co-supervisors. So you don't have to put all of your eggs in one basket. You can actually choose a co-supervisor, which will give you a little bit of an insurance against the bad aspects of your primary supervisor. Now, during my PhD, I had three supervisors. During my postdoc, I had five supervisors. And that's because five supervisors, they all get a little bit of credit for my work. Oh, what a great thing. One person's work, my work, can get distributed and everyone gets a little bit of share of the kudos, their academic kudos, which is why they start to get these big groups. But three was probably the maximum you want. Two is ideal primary supervisor, which is normally the more experienced supervisor. They've had more PhD students. They're a little bit more established, but then looking and asking for a co-supervisor to be um, as part of your PhD project means that when this person, when the primary supervisor just, you know, is away, is uh, at a conference, or the relationship just breaks down a little bit, you have a co-supervisor that can balance out the bad aspects. So as I'm talking to a, um, as a primary supervisor, I would also be thinking, well, who brings other skills or other um, personality traits that I really like, that, or who's got a great reputation in the um, in the department? Who will do anything for their PhD students? Who's just a lovely person? Like that is the sort of person that I'd be looking for to bring on as a co-supervisor that can help balance out the you know the super ego-driven successful professor that will probably end up being your primary supervisor. Um, so yeah, co-supervisors are worth their weight in gold if you select them carefully and they're able to balance out all the bad aspects of your primary supervisor. Okay, so there are all of the five things that I think are so super important. Let me know in the comments what you would add. And look, selecting a supervisor is so important because it really dictates the feeling, the success, the happiness that you'll feel throughout your PhD. And uh, it is something that a lot of people rush into. A lot of people go from undergraduate to masters to PhD almost with the same supervisor. Now, quick little bonus tip is that a good lecturer does not necessarily mean a good supervisor. So just make sure you go through all of the processes that I've talked about in this video. Um, you can't just rely on them being a good lecturer. Um, you have to sort of see what they're like as a person, as a researcher, they're two different beasts. A lovely lecturer is a person who, you know, lectures is lovely, helps people out, but then chucking grant money, success, egos, you get the researcher and they're completely different people in my opinion. Um, so yeah, make sure you go through all the processes here and you'll be sure not to be caught out by the unexpected change of personalities once you enter the academic world. If you're new to this channel, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification. If this video has been helpful, please give me a thumbs up and share uh, with all of your other friends who are considering doing a PhD. Let's make sure they end up with supervisors they actually like. Nice people, nice supervisors should get nice PhD students, but it doesn't always work like that, does it? All right, I shall see you in the next video.